Welcome to another deep dive edition of the Chicks on the Right podcast. Man, are we ever fortunate today because we have the gorgeous and talented and brilliant Shannon Bream with us for today's episode. And Shannon, right off the bat, we have to say congratulations to you for the massive success of your latest book. This is The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak. This is sort of the follow-up to your first book, which also did amazingly well. Mm -hmm. And so massive congrats. I was curious, because uh, we'd like to talk about a lot of things with you, but first and foremost, the book. And I'm curious how you went about choosing the stories and the women that you mm -hmm. wanted to spotlight specifically. That's a really collaborative thing. You know, I'm talking with um, the publisher of the book um, and other people that I want to get involved. I've got a great researcher down in Dallas who has actually been to seminary and is a theologian, all the things I'm actually not. And we talk about who should we include. In the first book, I really fought to include Rahab the prostitute because I love the idea that God uses us no matter who we are, where we are, flawed. Like, listen, we're all flawed. Jesus would be the only person in the Bible if we're just going with unflawed people. So um, I said, listen, let's include her. I think that's interesting. Um, and, and, you know, we come together and, and listen, in this book too, we included some difficult stories, some very dysfunctional families. And we thought, all right, who are characters that people can relate to, that they can maybe see some good and some bad in and actually find applications for their life now. Yeah, I love I love the focus on imperfections. We were talking a little bit about yeah. that before we got out with you and how um, that relates to, to real women, because as a mom, I'm totally imperfect. <laughs> I think about that all the time. I'm like, am I doing this right? Am I doing the right things? And I constantly I say that to Miriam all the time to mock all the time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope I'm doing this right. I'm doing that right. And I, I think sometimes we beat ourselves up. And so I'm, I'm sure that's one of the reasons why your book has resonated so much with, with moms, with women, with people, right? And there, and it has, it's what is it? 15 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. People are, I'm probably even messing that up, but it's like, but people are so, people are so hungry for this kind of a book because yeah. I love the focus on the imperfection part because you don't have to be. Um, perfect in the eyes of God, right? Yeah, we'd have no hope. I mean, honestly, none of us can ever get there. And I love that it's not based on our works, our ability to get to perfection, because we can't. I sometimes right. talk to my friends like, gosh, there's this same thing that I struggle with in my life. And I keep going back and forth and I've asked God for forgiveness and for help. And, you know, we think about this in the, in the terms of parenthood. Like if your child was sick and suffering with something and they were fighting back against it, you would be in that fight with them. You would be cheering for them. You're on their side. You're pulling for them. You wouldn't say you need to get better. I'm sick of you being sick. And I'm, I'm so ashamed and, and upset with you that you can't get better. Um, God knows we're human. I think he knows our hearts and sees where we are striving. We are, you know, fighting to get better and to um, be more of what he uh, can make us. Um, but I don't think he's coming at us with constant condemnation. And that's something I sort of had to unlearn from earlier in my life. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it speaks to the human condition. There's a quote that I saw and it's, it's faith. It, it's from you. It's faith is more of a twisting road than a short line. And mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Can I think? I, Cause again, it speaks to all of us and that is, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right about that. I love it. Well, Shannon, guys. there, there's something that I read, um, a story that I've read a couple t different times about some really a tough struggle that you and your husband went through with his brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And the story that I've only read the story. So I was hoping you could say the story to us because I, I just I want to hear it in your own words. The <coughs> moment where you recognized, and I think you guys were out for pizza, mm -hmm. that he was regaining some of the use of his mouth again. Can you mm -hmm. can you tell that story? Because I want to hear it instead of reading it. Yes. And I'm going to try not to cry. <laughs> you brought that up. Um, you know, I, there are so many people that we've met along the road who have been through a brain tumor struggle and it's really difficult. We were really young, um, just engaged and then just married when this was happening. And so it was devastating to find out you're 24 years old and you think you're healthy and strong. He was a D1 college athlete and started having some weird problems and, and you know, eventually was diagnosed as a brain tumor, had um, extensive surgery and treatment to get him back. Um, but what we found out in the process is that there were serious complications he could have among them. He would lose hearing, which he did. I always make sure I'm on his good ear when it's something I really need him to hear, like focus. This is the good ear. Don't, you can't use that as an excuse. Um, so he did lose hearing and he had facial paralysis for a while too. If you've seen somebody that's had Bell's palsy or stroke, I mean, that's immediately how he, you know, was recovering afterwards because, um, there was d damage to his nerves. So, um, 
the doctors had told us if there's going to be any return there, you'll probably see it at the corner of his mouth and it will start within a few months. And if not, it's probably not going to come back. So we were about a month out from our wedding and super poor. I was in law school and he was working when he could, when he was well. And we were at this pizza buffet um, for lunch and I'm looking at him and I see something move. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I start to see some movement in the corner of his mouth. And it's a very tiny, slow process. And I looked at him again and I said, I think your mouth is moving. I think there's some movement in that corner where they said it would start. And so I get out my compact. I'm shoving it in his face. He's looking. He sees the moving. We're jumping around crying in Pizza Hut at the buffet at lunchtime. Like, it's moving. It's moving. Oh, my gosh. It's really happening. And that was the first little bit of hope we'd had in so long that he would have a chance at a pretty full recovery, which God, thank you, God, he does. Wow. I love that I love story. It. I just love it. Yeah, so, that, so is great. Awesome. that is awesome. I love it. Very grateful. So, so um, we, we should probably, we need to switch gears a little bit to what, um, what is going on in our country right now, which is all this Supreme Court, um, mm -hmm. I, I, as Mark would say, hullabaloo, which <laughs> I mean, I, we, we've been talking about it obviously quite a bit over the past week, week and a half. Um, really because it's it is dominated the news cycle, which I never dreamed it would be dominating the news cycle right now in light of the fact that so many other things are going on in our country that are terrible, terrible things. Um, but this is a terrible thing too, obviously, but it is it is it has consumed the news cycle in, in a time when the you know the left is is uh, well, they're not doing a very good job and a lot of other things. If you look at a list of things that um, they have, completely destroyed <laughs> at least and, and right now i look at gas prices i look at you know immigration i look at a lot of other things and tick lists and and i the top of the list for things that you know i think i'm thinking about for midterms and for the upcoming election cycles uh, abortion rights is not really something that i would put probably on the top of the list for a lot of um you know people to have at the top of the list for i, I guess a priority but um but for the left it is a massive massive um, concern for them. And so can you speak to that like, when it comes to just news cycles, and you've been in this industry mm -hmm. probably a lot longer than we have. Um, the last week and a half, just what has happened and the leak and how the leak is not the big story. Obviously, it's, um, it's something else. And that's a concern to us too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all the polling, you mentioned these really difficult topics, not good for the White House right now, not good for Dems going into midterms, which historically this would be a tough year for them. The party that's in power after their president has been elected. Um, they know that, I mean, it's poll after poll after poll after poll all across the spectrum that show they have real trouble on the generic congressional ballot and on all of these issues, the economy, things that people vote on are really tough for them. So for me, the leak story is very much a two pronged story. The leak, I think, is devastating. I've covered the court for 15 years and I've never seen anything even remotely close to this. It is such a breach of the sanctity of that place where the justices can vehemently disagree with each other. But, man, they have each other's backs. They are friends. They are protectors and defenders of each other and of the court. So I think it's devastating. It really shakes the foundations of our ability to trust in institutions when I think many Americans are having real trouble um, trusting institutions, especially in Washington. The court sort of seemed insulated from that. So the leak is a giant issue. I think the chief is going to be so determined um, because this happened on his watch and he's very protective of the court and um, what it means to America and what it represents. I don't think he's going to give up until he gets a name. I also think the person, if it turns out that it's a clerk on the left, um, if that turns out to be the case, they may step forward and take the credit, actually, because they're getting so much praise from the left for, hey, this was an historic moment. I think it's also crazy that we have no idea if those five votes held together and if the, uh, the opinion we ultimately get is authored by Alito, if it's authored by the chief, if it's offered, authored by someone else, if it does overturn Roe, we just don't know. But yes, the content of it, I think, is something that is a bit of a gift for Democrats in that it gives them something to rally their base around. Mm -hmm. yeah, and right. we see the rallies, we see um, the talking points you're going to pay in, in November. It's kind of the one thing that they can take to the folks and say, your vote really matters. You got to show up the House, the Senate. These things matter in confirming Supreme Court justices and trying to get rid of the filibuster. There's so many things um, that Democrats can now point to their base and say, you should be worried and you got to turn out for us. So for okay. them, it's a potentially very good campaign issue. 
Have you seen yeah. though that there are now there are now accusations by people on the left or, or suggestions by people on the left that surely it was Clarence Thomas's wife who was the leaker. Surely it was a conservative justice mm -hmm. who was the leaker, which I've just started to see today. And I thought, well, you can't have it both ways. You're either calling a leftist clerk a hero or mm -hmm. you're blaming the like none of what they're suggesting makes any sense. There's like that wouldn't make any disconnect. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, I get that. I, yeah, I get that theory. I get where they're going with that to say maybe that coalition of five was somebody was getting weak in the knees and falling apart. And so somebody who was part of that five coalition, we know it was at least five because it was entitled the opinion of the court. Maybe mm -hmm. somebody was getting weak in the knees and somebody on the conservative side said, I'm going to put this opinion out there so people know this is what we were writing. This is what we were doing. And now if you don't vote for this, you're going to look like you were intimidated um, out of doing it. So, I mean, I totally okay. get the theory. I think it's... Um, not probable. Anything is possible. I mean, I'm not ruling anything out at this point, and I do think we're going to get answers. But I think it's a distraction to to now enable people. You know, the White House says there's passion on all sides of this issue, so people show up all weekend. You know, in, in houses of worship, at private homes of justices, and right. I have been really encouraged to see the White House in the last 24 hours say we would never condone this. We don't condone violence or harassment, um, and and to also see the Washington Post. I mean, that's not a right leaning organization to come out with an editorial that says, leave them alone at home. Like you can't cross that line. We have to have some kind of line of rule of law and respect for each other. Even if we vehemently disagree about things, you can't show up at people's houses. So yeah. I think there's a, a discomfort on the left with some of what's happening on that front. I think it's only that only is because I, I think the American people, and may, mm -hmm. I don't want to say all American people, but I think a lot, the majority of American yes. people are starting to get a little bit uncomfortable with the rage. You know, there's just a lot. We saw the rage in 2020. There's just this rage that people are becoming generally uncomfortable with. Not everybody, but a lot of people out here are starting to go, oh, my gosh, this is becoming a little out of hand. And I have I have a question about what if the, le if the leaker is found out? We find out who the leaker is. What happens to that person? Do we Listen, know? If what? A, yeah, if it's a clerk. Um, they're fired, obviously. Well, whoever it is, they're fired. Um, I don't, in my wildest imagination, think it would be a justice. That would be an impeachment situation. But a clerk or, a, a, you know, court personnel, somebody, they'd be fired if they're an attorney. They're going to be disbarred. Um, their legal career is over. That's it. But, but yeah. I feel like they made that calculation. Whoever did this, for whatever reason, um, has counted the cost. I think they have, because mm -hmm. there's no way you can make this decision without thinking, I'm potentially blowing up my entire professional life. Now, if it turns out to be somebody on the left, um, they could end with their, uh, their own TV show. They could write a book. I mean, this, <laughs> there, oh my gosh. There, are, there are ways to use um, that background in that moment in history. So that's why I'm just so fascinated to see. So I think it, it's the most egregious thing, but I think we'll get a name. So it benefits them. So ultimately, it could it could actually turn out really benefiting this individual. I mean, because we 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 talk about this all the time on our show that you know we reward awful behavior in this country. Constantly. We do that a lot. We do it a lot. And so this mm -hmm. potentially could be another one of those cases where we we do that, and that is so gross. <laughs> so gross. Yeah, I agree with you. There's a yeah. lot of gross behavior uh, recently. And I think you're so right with what you said. The vast majority of Americans, I don't care if they lean left or right, pro-choice, pro-life. I really don't think they're OK with what we're seeing. Um, professor Jonathan Turley, well-known law professor, had a great mm -hmm. piece on his blog yesterday about this addiction to rage that you mentioned. Yeah. Like, right. We have to call it out, whether it comes from extremists on the right or the left, and say, this stuff is not okay. Um, we saw a lot of this, a lot of uh, last couple of years calls to confront people at the gas station, the grocery. And we yeah. saw, you know, Sarah Sanders and Ted Cruz and his wife run out of restaurants. Um, we've seen people harassed all across the spectrum, but there's been a focus, I think, very much on targeting the right lately, sort of with the idea that um, if what they're doing is in our judgment, the left's judgment, harmful, then there's this growing feeling of the ends justifies the means. And we are justified in these public confrontations. And, um, you know, when you have the Senate Majority Leader himself last year, Chuck Schumer, standing on the steps of the Supreme Court saying you've unleashed a whirlwind and you will pay for these off, quote unquote awful decisions if you go there, specifically calling out Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh by name, um, we got to be careful with that stuff. If, if people want right. to point to January 6th and say the president had overheated rhetoric that caused people to go and do physical activity at the Capitol, we have to look at that if the left says it, if the right says it, and, and decide right. what standard we're going to have. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm curious because you mentioned that there's, you know, this great camaraderie uh, amongst the justices and that they do have each other's backs. You've been in a position where you've been covering them for 15 mm -hmm. years or so. And so you you get the inner workings of the Supreme Court probably better <laughs> than anybody. How, how have you seen that specific aspect of it change with the arrival or with the, uh, the confirmation of the new justices? Because there's been quite a bit of turnover, really, mm -hmm. in, in just the last Last five or six years, mm -hmm. how has that, how do they adapt? Like, how are they welcomed in? And how does that, how do they, how do they keep the nine people mm -hmm. cohesive when you get these brand new personalities? It, or is there like mm -hmm. clicks or do they act, are they clicky? <laughs> I'm Probably, like that. we're sitting yeah. in this part of the cafeteria. You guys can sit over <laughs> right. there. Right, um, I'm curious, yeah. Now, listen, pre-COVID, yes. I think it was a lot easier for them to assimilate. It changes the court, I think, very much when you lose a personality and gain one, when there are only nine people and this is a lifetime thing. Right. Um, you know, pre-COVID, I think it was interesting because they would have lunch together almost every day. And you can't talk about cases, but you can talk about movies and books and kids and trips and grandkids and, and that kind of thing. So they really were huh. building relationship and being together so much. You know, Justice Kavanaugh, who went through a bruising confirmation, has talked openly about how Justice Ginsburg very much welcomed him right in. Like, you're one of oh. us. We've got a job to do. And like, was very kind to him. Um, I think COVID has complicated things because it's a little trickier to, you know, add someone new when you're going to be, um, you know, restricted in your ability to get together, spend time, whether it's at, you know, the conference room, having these lunches every day, that stops, or with families, even getting together or friends, because they do those kinds of things and they welcome each other in. So I think COVID has put a strain on that, along with the politics of the last mm -hmm. couple of years has put a strain on that. So um, I don't know that they're back to to those lunches and to those get togethers. Um, you know, at the end of the term each year before COVID, Justice Breyer would have several of, us of the press corps together and we would go to lunch with him at this, you know, not so fancy Chinese restaurant that he loves over <laughs> on Capitol Hill and just spend time and talk with him and hear his stories. And I'm like, gosh, he's retiring this year. I hope that he feels safe enough in the protocols and whatever's gone on um, with vaccination or what, you know, all those things that he will let us do this last lunch with him because it's those kinds of things that give us a window into how they're all kind of doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's That's so, really it's such an interesting thing. Such an interesting thing. It really thing. is. How did, you, how did you make the shift from, from being a lawyer and practicing mm -hmm. law to where you are now? Like what was the mm -hmm. light bulb moment for you where you were like, I don't want to practice law. I yeah. want to be in the media. That happened right. in law school. <laughs> so you're like, like, law school is, is yeah. not a lot of fun. I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> I love the int intellectual practice of it. I love the researching. And that's one thing law school really taught me was about researching, which I think is helpful in any job you go to do. I'd always right. been a news junkie, but my dad seriously, RIP, my awesome father, Ed, um, he was of the mind that you're going to law school or med school. He told me that just pick one. Cause I don't want to hear about boys and marriage engagements. <laughs> I don't want to hear anything until you get through one of those. I actually did get married my last year of law school, but, um, you know, I, my dad knew that education and study was a strength for me and really pushed me in that. So I'm glad I went to law school and practice, you know, for a little while. Um, but I never got over kind of that current events news junkie thing. Mm, and so yeah. I decided I was going to go do an internship at night at the at the one of the local stations and that's a really long story how i eventually got that worked out but you know all the interns are like 20 and i was almost pushing 30 at this point and i would go there and hide it from my law firm whether nights or weekends whenever i could get some time away from the firm which was pretty demanding and i would shadow people you know producers and um it, reporters and anybody cameramen who would let me go with them and just kind of learn from the ground up and i would take things back to the boss there and say Hey, could you give me some feedback on the writing, on the whatever I'm doing? And I would get that a lot. And finally, at the end of my internship, I went to him, to the boss there at the station. And I said, um, I'm quitting my law firm. And he was like, no one's offered you a job. I'm like, yes, just a technicality. I'm stepping out in faith. I feel like this is my path. This is what I'm going to do. So I went to my firm and kind of told them one by one. And most of them thought probably I was crazy. But a couple of them said, you know, there's something else I always wanted to do. So I'm going to be cheering for you. And I got that first job and I worked 2 a.m to 11 a.m. And I answered wow. the phones, made coffee, and I wrote scripts for the morning anchors for the morning show. And every time somebody quit, I would pick up their job. I started working prompter, which you should never give to someone who is not actually <laughs> trained on it. They are like the most important <laughs> person in the whole show. So I did that. then there was a producer who um, who quit doing the morning cut-ins we would have to Good Morning America. So those were only like three minutes long. And so I started producing those. And 
little by little, they would start letting me go out in the field and um, eventually started reporting. You know, the boss was like, if no one else is available, they've all been in car wrecks and we have breaking news, you can go. So I just started to build from there. But when my boss and his boss left in a big management change after I'd only been at this for a few months. And the new guy called me in after a couple of weeks and he said, you're the worst person I've ever <laughs> seen on TV. You will never make it in this business. And I hope you're a better lawyer than you are a reporter. It was brutal. Oh, my gosh. Oh my but gosh. it was a good shock to the system. Very humbling. I think God keeps us humble. And um, I learned a lot in the process of kind of trying to pick myself back up and taking months to find another job and being very humble about I'll start anywhere. I'll try anything. And um, that's how it started by getting fired. <laughs> Tenacious. You're just tena tenacious and a good work ethic. I mean, I think that, that I think that's the lot. secret to almost anything. Honestly, right. when people ask me for advice, I'm like, just don't take no for an answer. There were other yeah. people who would get tired of getting bloodied and, and fighting and whatever you're doing. You just got to outlast people. That's half of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so how do you that, how do you stop? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that that's a trait, too, of Gen Xers. Shannon, I think that that mm -hmm. is like, honestly, I think that our generation has a lot of that in us where we just like started at the, gr the ground level of a lot of things and then just sort of worked our way up. I think that that is a little bit of a trait of, of our generation, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you guys yeah. see the video that was out a few months ago about a guy who's walking by and he bumps into a wall? This video was so yes. good. And it was like Gen yes. Xers and he just like <laughs> keeps going and then he gets to like the next one and they're like, hey, man. And by the end, the person's laying up again. I'm like, that wall attacked me. And I was like, thank you, us Gen Xers. I'm sure that the greatest generation looked at us at some point and like, these people are losers. They're never going to get yes. <laughs> So I'm, so, I'm all team Gen X. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As are we. Mm -hmm. So yep. when you're, you're obviously, you've been at Fox, what, like 15 years now. How, mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, Fox is constantly attacked, even by the current administration. Like you guys are on the crap list of the White House mm -hmm. administration, constantly called out. How do you and the rest of the Fox folk, how do you deal with constantly being like treated so poorly? I mean, because because you are. I, I, it's so unfair, I think, in many ways, the way that the whole station is treated. How do you Most guys all deal? Yeah, mostly by the White House. Yeah. I mean, yeah. listen, I think you got to have a thick skin uh, and yeah. mine certainly thickened up over the last 15 years. We're very much a family internally, you know, and we kind of are like, it's us against the world. And we know there are incoming attacks all the time. I personally think the White House secretly totally loves Peter Ducey. Um, he <laughs> definitely has a report with Ben Saki and with the president. I think they kind of love him. I mean, Peter was on the campaign trail with the president um, as a candidate. And I think that they there is a very friendly kind of sparring relationship that they have. Um, yeah, it's difficult when the White House locks us out from things that we feel like everybody should be involved with and uh, as the press and, and to have the same kind of access. But I'm very thankful for Ducey and for his um, his inroads and his initiatives over there. No but you know, honestly, we we take incoming from all kinds of different organizations and groups and people who, you know, we have different parts of Fox. If you want to go after opinion, that's part of what we do. And they have um, enormous entertainment value, enormous thought provoking value and millions and millions of viewers who love what they do. Just like every other station out there has got the opinion in the news. We have a very strict dividing line between those. I mean, the show that I do is listen, you're going to hear both viewpoints. I want Democrats on the show. I want Republicans on the show. I want Libertarians on the show because I trust our viewers. They're smart enough for us to put the info out, to hear the debates, and they can make their own decisions. I think Bingo. what gets tricky is when other places blur that line between, are you a journalist? Are you advocating? Are you an opinion person? I think all of it's great. We just have to be clear about what we're doing. All right. Well, you can you, catch you, you, Shannon Bream weeknights, right? And and are you on weekends too or just the weeknight show now? I am only occasionally because the book and because okay. SCOTUS has been keeping us so busy. But I'm I'm Monday through Friday, midnight uh, Eastern and nine o'clock Pacific and pop up wherever the SCOTUS is keeping us uh, on our toes too. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do I it because I'm in bed by 8 p.m. every night. What? Right. Man. I am not going to be impressed. <laughs> We were telling your producer that she is in bed really early. So you are, we bow down to your schedule. I love it, you guys. You, it. you know, you, you go on adrenaline when you have to. Yes. <laughs> thank you well, so thank much you so for much. joining us. We yes, we appreciate it. It's a treat to be with you guys. And, you know, Gen X, I feel like my team X. This is our team X. <laughs> and we all going to stick together. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll absolutely be following you. Thank you so much. Yes, Thank you. For Peace sure. Bye. Bye bye. And no one's. Oh. Oh. What happened? <laughs> I accidentally kicked her out too soon. Oh, no. You did. Oh, my God. She said something about <laughs> dogs. Wait, let me can, about I dogs? can bring her back. I brought her back. Yay. <laughs> no, I just said, say? She, she said none of our dogs went crazy. I so. know. No, I know. no dogs. <laughs> I know. That was, right. I was like, you kicked her out. She was talking about dogs. Yes. That's okay. <laughs> that is a bonus. That's okay. Well, great to be with you guys. You too. And Thank we'll you just retweet and share whatever you got tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. We Thank appreciate you. it. Have such a great day. Bye. You too. Talk soon. Bye-bye.